love you, Amari. Amen. You're becoming a nice young man of God. Looking. Can I get amen back here, guys? You know, my wife wants you to help her teach some kids, don't you? Can you ask her one? Ask him one time to do that. Yeah. Well, maybe one day you could help, couldn't you? Yeah, oh yeah, he'd do. He'd be excellent. Yeah, well, he'd be excellent. I know it. Put you on the spot like that. You know. The Lord is good. I worship Him. I thank Him for all that He's done. Thank you, Father God, that you have always been the God that have shown up, Lord God. When you start a people on a journey, you have always shown up for those people, Lord God, along the way. You have always been faithful, Lord. When the Israelites left, Lord God, and they were on a journey with you, it wasn't that they did, weren't faced with obstacles. You just made a way through it. So I thank you, Lord God, that we're on a path that you would want us to be on, and we can expect you to show up in our lives, Lord God, as we're obedient to you, Lord. Well, Father God, we thank you, Lord God, that we can expect you to show up when we submit our lives to you, Lord God, and we allow you not only to be our Savior, but our Lord, that you direct the path, Lord God. And, whew, Father God, we can expect you to show up oh, when we do that, Lord God. So we thank you, Father, as we, tonight, as we give, that is a part of the submitted life, Lord God. That is part of saying yes to you along the path of life, Father, that we are looking to you to provide, Father God, for us individually and for this church, Lord God. Many hands make light work. So let us all, Lord God, be givers in here. So we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you as you give, guys. are you, Lord? You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great are you, 
Cause it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you. Shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great. Are you Lord? It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. Pastor George will be up here in just a few minutes to, uh, to bring us the word tonight. <clears throat> you know, I know it stresses these ladies out to start to lead worship on their own. It has to. But you know, I appreciate it being your pastor that you're willing to say yes. Because you look at it as God coming to you and saying, will you do this? It's not man speaking to you, it's God. And you know, people in this congregation has told me this. They say, well, pastor, we believe that you're a man of God. And we trust you when you come to us and ask us to do something, even though it may make me feel uncomfortable. And tonight, I just want to thank these ladies. I mean, we have talent. And I just know as, as these ladies continue to be used, these men continue to be used, that it'll become easier and you'll flow and you'll never look back because God's hands on you. And you'll just you continue to enjoy it. At first you do it out of obedience. And then after a while you start to enjoy it. Can I get amen on that right there? Let's give God a hand clap. Pastor George. Hey, don't y'all like it what uh, Carol Galvin's doing up here? Carol Wright, I'm sorry. 
Carol. I just should have just said Carol. I'm, you got your gifts, Carol Galvin. She's got her gifts. We're going to miss those gifts while she's at the beach for a month. Mm-hmm, a whole month. Mm. Everybody look at her and just go, oh. Huh. <laughs> Amen. I want more summer. I'd rather have more summer. I'm, I'm just. Amen. Now you, you, I tell you what, when it snows, you can come to my house and take all you want. Start with the driveway. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's right. That's right. Amen. You know, if you study worship, and, you know, it's not about professionalism. It's about the heart. That's all that matters. It's out of our hearts. And when we have a heart of worship, that's what's pleasing to God. That's what he anoints. Amen. And it's the anointing that brings us into his presence and, and you know, the ushers in. God's presence in this place and I'll tell you God is stirring and uh, it's it's getting greater uh, I don't know what all is going on but it's just a stirring taking place uh, he, he's moving uh, among young people and um, it, it's just amazing what he's doing there's been a, a number of uh, things going on with our our schools just in this last week um, they had a uh, Revival at uh, University of Arkansas, and 10,000 students from 67 different universities showed up. And they said, Jesus met us there. We were blown away by his presence in the room and how he carried over to baptisms of the night we'll never forget. Just a week earlier, uh, University of South Carolina, 4,000 students gathered to lift up the name of Jesus. Hundreds of students made life-changing decisions to follow Jesus. Many were baptized. Uh, God uh, moved. Students were set free. And uh, previous to that, there was another move at Texas A&M, Ohio State. God's on the move, people, and God is stirring people up. And uh, that, I'm telling you, there's a stirring going on. I, I, I mean, this past couple of weeks, I just can't. I mean, it's just, it's just he's just moving and speaking and just... You know, he's just doing something, and something getting ready to break forth. And that's why we got to get in. Everybody's got to get in. Everybody's got to 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 uh, step up and and get in, press in, whatever you got to do. Stir yourself up, but get into what God is doing. Be a come part of it. Amen. God wants to use everybody in this church. Amen. And uh, you know, as we talked about the last time uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Get rid of your thinking, thinking, and start thinking the way God thinks. Amen? you you got to change the way you think. Get in the Word of God. Renew your mind to what God says. Amen? Speak what God says. See yourself as God sees you. That way you can step in to what God wants for you. What you get in your heart, that's what you're going to become. Amen? So get it in your heart. If you're a worshiper, get in your heart, and you'll be a worshiper. Amen? If God's called you to do something, get it in your heart. God's going to do it. But it's got to begin with changing our minds because that's where the devil tries to trip you up and uh, mess with you. He, he messes with your mind. So we've got to change the way we think and renew our mind. So, uh, so last week we, we looked at that whole concept uh, from Ro uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance that race is set before us. So... Uh, this, uh, tonight I want to just look at another aspect of this. And it begins with the, the sin which so easily ensnares us. Uh, isn't that true? So easily ensnares us because it's deceptive. Amen? It, it comes from the enemy. It's a trap. It's a snare. It's an intentional misleading to get you into his net. 
Amen. So that's why it so easily ensnares us. When you, when you go fishing, you use bait that entices the fish to bite. Amen. When you, when you want to get rid of mice, you, you use cheese or, or peanut butter because they like it. Well, Jesus, uh, Satan comes as a wolf in sheep's clothing or as an as a, 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 a angel of light. And sin is usually wrapped in some enticing way to make us want to bite. Amen. It might be appear to be good. People say it's good until you get in and find out it's not. Amen. Or we might say it's just okay. It's not so bad. You know, it's just a little thing. Just this one time. No big deal. You know, uh, everybody does it. That's one of the biggies. Uh, you know, we may deceive ourselves to, to uh, you know, the, the consequences of of sin, that we, we justify it out of so-called necessity. What, what else am I supposed to do? See? Or it may just be a weak spot of, of lust that's never been dealt with in our life. As we talked about the last time, the enemy, the enemy will do anything he can to either keep you out of the race or to hinder us or derail us or sidetrack us uh, 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 to keep us from finishing that race and receiving the prize. So 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, again, he tells us, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. So we want to run to win. We want to run to get to the finish. Amen? In Revelation chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, he says, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. So we got to get our eyes on the prize. The prize is eternal life. The prize is foreverness with God. So. Jesus warns us the devil is going to try to get you out. He's going to try to get you out of the race. He's going to do everything he can. But Jesus says, be faithful unto death because it's a crown of life that we're after. In Revelation 3.11, behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one take your crown. Don't give in. Hold on tight. Be in the Word. Be in prayer. Be in a place of strengthening. Every day you're being strengthened in your faith, getting to know God better, getting in that deeper, intimate relationship with Him that you know that you know that you know He is faithful. He's going to keep you. He's going to get you through. He has a way out of whatever you're dealing with. Now, this was written to a church in Philadelphia who had kept His Word and did not deny His name. So he's telling them, hold fast. Hold fast. The devil not only uses distractions from from keeping us going forward, but he also uses besetting sins to ensnare us. And no matter how you look at it, the wages of sin is death. That is a law of God. In some way, shape, or form, the wages of sin is death. And unfortunately, the devil is never satisfied until he gets, his, gets you all the way into his trap. Amen? If he can give you an inch, he's going to take a foot. If you give him a foot, he's going to take a mile. And we have to understand something. Willful, known sin opens a door which is hard to shut again. The real danger is where it leads. In 1 John 3, 4, he says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. In Matthew 24, 12, Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now, is he telling us here? Jesus talking about the last days. He said, what, what, what will it be when, you know, when are you coming back? And Jesus says, well, these things are going to happen right before I come. This is what it's going to look like around you. Lawlessness is going to abound. Look around you today in this, around the world. Everywhere you look is lawlessness. I mean, violence, bloodshed, you name it. Deception, lies, you know, just lawlessness everywhere. There is no moral standard today, amen? But he's talking about this creeping into the church when he says the love of many will grow cold that word love is agape he's talking about christians giving into lawlessness 
which is sin. And what happens is your love grows cold. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, he says, Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You see the pattern. When you yield to sin, it hardens your heart. You see, the first time you do something, you're, con you're convicted. I, I don't care. It, some of the worst sinners that, you know, that never had a good life, any, any good, the first time they do something seriously wrong, there is a conviction in every one of us. You, you can't shake that. But then the second time you press through, and it's a little easier, and then a little easier, and a little easier, and finally you got people that walk around shooting babies in the head with actually no, no reaction, no conviction, no nothing, because they are dead because sin hardens the heart. Now look at this. What happens when it hardens your heart through the deceitfulness of sin? It's the deceitfulness of sin. What happens is you depart from the living God. God doesn't leave us. We leave him. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned, what do they do? They hid themselves from God. What do we do when we get into trouble? We don't come to church. We hide ourselves out. We, we, we're embarrassed. We're, we're shamed. So rather than running to the one we need, we allow the devil to work on us. And we get into this depression, this pity party, whatever. And eventually what happens is you, as you uh, let that pattern of sin go on in your life, if you don't deal with it, it hardens your heart and you get further and further away from God. And that means you get further and further away from your church and from your help and the things that you need. So he says, uh, for we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear my voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. See, Israel hardened their hearts against God, and they couldn't come into the promised land. They rebelled against God, and that hardness kept growing in the, in the camp, and they did not go into the promised land. They couldn't enter in that place that God had given them. They had to march around the wilderness for 40 years until that whole generation died off. It's a dangerous place to give in to this culture around us. Amen. In James chapter 1, verse 12, he says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. There again he is. We're running a race for the crown of life. But to get through this race, we've got to endure temptation. You see, we're all subject to temptation. Jesus was tempted. Amen. And we may fall, we may fail along the way. We, we, we may make mistakes. We're in a war. We may lose some battles. But ultimately, we know that through Jesus Christ, we're going to win the war. Amen? We're going to win the war. It's already, it's already done. So if you get into trouble, if you make a mistake, if you, the, the devil gets you in a, in a, in a, you know, a, a moment of time, don't stay there. Don't stay there. Amen? We humble ourselves. We confess our sin. We, 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 we owe back to God. We call out to God. We confess it. And God does what? He forgives us, and he cleanses us from unrighteousness. We move on. We, we get back into the race. We learn from our mistakes, and we carry on until the, 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 the next place. And guess what? God brings new beginnings. I don't care how far away you've gotten. I don't care how far you've fallen. God is a God of new beginnings. If we will repent, if we will be return unto God, he will restore us. He will raise us up again, and he will give us a new beginning, a new beginning, a new start in our race to continue forward and go for that prize again. Don't stay in that place. Don't let the, lie, the devil lie to you and deceive you to get you to where, well, there's no hope. I, 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 you know, God can't forgive me. You know, all this stuff. Again, get your, get your mind right. 
God forgives. God is merciful. God is compassionate, and he wants restoration. Amen? In Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in us will carry it on until, until completion, even until the day of Jesus Christ. If we just keep pressing and if we just keep, you know, you mess up, God forgive me, move on, he's going to continue to work and work and work. Why? Because God doesn't want anybody to be saved. God doesn't want to lose anybody. Know how the enemy works, and you can defeat him from the very outset. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 and 27, be angry and do not sin. It's not the anger that is the sin. It's what you do with it. It's how you respond to it. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Husbands and wives, do not go to bed angry. Because that's when the devil works, from 12 to 5. That's when he does all his dirty work while you're sleeping. He's working on you. Don't go to bed angry. Amen. Forgive and move on. Amen. Why? Do not give the devil a place. Don't give place to the devil. That's what you're doing. You're giving place to the devil. The devil can, has legal right to work in every dark place. Where there's sin, he has legal right to operate. When you sin, you open the door to the devil. Amen. In James chapter 1, verse 14, each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my, love, my beloved brethren. Over and over again, he warns us, don't be deceived. Why? Because the devil is a great deceiver. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. He does everything he can to deceive us. Temptation is not sin. Amen? It's when sin is conceived that it becomes, uh, uh, or the t temptation is conceived, it becomes sin. In the Passion Bible, he says, instead, it is each person's own desires or thoughts that drag them into evil and lure them away into darkness. And evil desires give birth to evil actions, and when sin is fully mature, it can murder you. Because the wage of sin is death. Sin is conceived when it goes from here to here. Where does the devil work? He's a liar. He tempts you. He works on your mind, on your thoughts. He plants thoughts in you. He, he reminds you of stuff. He does everything again to get your mind uh, uh, deceived. That's why you got to have your mind renewed and stayed upon God. Amen? Because then he has no place. So sin is conceived when it gets from your mind to your heart. And this happens when we give place to it by not immediately dealing with it. You deal with it immediately, and it can't go anywhere. Amen? It's dealt with. But what do we do? We think on it. We continue to look at it. We don't change the channel. We don't flip the page. We look. We're thinking. You see what's happening? The devil's moving. He's working. Amen? We meditate on it. We do something else and just keep thinking Right back to that thing. Amen? And once it gets into your heart, it works to ultimately get us to uh, act upon that thing. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the heart, we do the things we ought not to do if we give place to sin in our heart. It comes out of our mouth, our hands, whatever, whatever it is to manifest it. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, he tells us the danger of this. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if after they escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them in the beginning. Why? Because when you open that door, it's hard to shut. What is he telling us? 
You come into the kingdom of God, you're born again, you're going to be tempted. The, the, the devil's going to attempt it, or he's going to attack us. Why? Because he's waging war against anybody that worships God or has the testimony of Christ. We have to be aware of that. We know we're going to be tempted. It's what we do with it. Okay? It's not making a mistake. Okay? It's allowing that thing to grow inside of you to where you act out it, you act it out, and then the next time you act it out, it begins to become a continual thing in your life. And what happens is, what he's talking about here is, it comes to a place where that sin overcomes you. It takes you over you. It, it, it brings that, that uh, power of sin back into your heart. And, and notice he says, and are again entangled in them. It's a snare. It's a trap. You become entangled in it and overcome and that's where you're in trouble because now your heart is being hardened and you are moving away from God. In Romans chapter 6, verse 16, he says, Do you not know that who, to whom you present yourselves to slaves to obey, you are the one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Who you obey, you become that one slave whether it's for sin and the devil or for righteousness in God. When we reject temptation, when we stand upon the Word of God, when, when we turn that thing off, we, we, we shut that, that book, we, 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 we shut that thing, we, we get out, out of our mind, we don't give into it, we deal with it. We, we say, God, I, I, I reject that. Satan, I, I, I recognize what you're doing. I cast you down. I speak the blood over you. I speak the blood over my heart and mine. I am not receiving that thing. I'm not taking that. It's not who I am. I'm a blood-bought child of God, and I am walking and living it right. So I'm going to do it right in God because I have the Holy Ghost in me, and I'm going to follow God. And you shut it down, and it's over. It's finished, and you move on. It is written. After a couple times, the devil's just going to give up and find somebody else because he's wasting your time. Just like with Jesus. Three times. Three times he tempted him. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. And Jesus said, it is written, it is written, it is written. The devil put his tail between his legs and he had to leave. Why? He could find nothing in him. But he can't find nothing in us if we don't give him place. We don't give place to the devil. And when we, when we mess up again, you repent. You repent. When that conviction comes, you repent. You turn away from it. Amen? In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. In other words, they exercise self-constraint. You see, sin is, is, is not just blatant things that we think about immorality and, 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 you know, stealing or murder. Sin is also, we have natural, uh, 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 we have natural desires within us. We, you know, we, we have hunger, things like this. We have natural desires, but they need to be constrained because your natural desires can become sin. Amen. When you overeat, when you uh, uh, overindulge in anything, it can cause issues and problems. God constrains us in these things because they all do bad things physically to us. And God's trying to protect us. He's trying to keep us healthy. That We're, we're supposed to protect this temple because it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. And, and he says in, in verse, verse Corinthians 3, if anyone destroys this temple, God will destroy him. We got to do things that do not destroy this temple. That's why, you know, we talk about people argue about drinking or smoking or, you, you know, this and this and that. The, the, the real issue is right here, okay? Anything that is destroying this temple, anything that is, that is damaging this temple is not of God. And when we know when it says right on the pack, this causes cancer, that tells me that's something that I want to put in the, holy, the temple of the holy God because it's destroying it. It's hurting it. You see? So that's why we don't do those things. But just natural desires we have must be, we must exercise self-constraint. And that's why Paul was saying, we're going to run this race, and because we want to win it, we're going to be temperate in everything we do. We're not going to extremes. 
We're staying right down the middle line. We're not walking on the edge. We're not trying to, you, you know, get, get just close to the line we can without falling off. No, we're going to stay so far away that line that even if we fall down, we're not going to cross it. Amen. We just get right back up. The righteous fall down and rise up seven times. Why? Because we're not walking on the line. We're walking in the middle with God. So we mess up. We fall down. Yeah, God, forgive me. And keep on going. Keep running the race. Amen. And because we're Christians, when our brother falls down in the race, we stop and pick them up and, and keep them going with us. We exhort one another daily while it's yet day. Whereas we don't want anybody to fall short. We don't want anybody to be left behind. Did you ever see that in some of these races? I mean, in the Olympics even. And somebody falls down and gets hurt. And I guarantee you the person that stops is a Christian. He's trying to win the race. And he says, no, I'm going to help this person because they're hurt. And people count that person like a, a hero. Because they're willing to forsake their own race to help somebody else in that race. So Paul says, now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body. I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. I discipline my body. Everything I do, discipline our bodies. Whether it's food, whether it's, it's study, whether it's, you know, the things we're supposed to be doing in prayer, in, in, in getting enough sleep. I mean, all the natural and spiritual things. We discipline ourselves to do the best we can with what God has given us so that we can run the race. We have the strength. We have the, the, the resolve. We have the faith. We have the word. We have everything we need physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually to finish this race, to fight a good fight and get to the end, to endure to the end. All of these things need to be taken care of. In 1 Corinthians 7, 5, he says, Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again why? That Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. There's one of the keys. The lack of self-control. Satan knows your weakness. Well, guess what? One of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. We need to rely on the fruit of the Spirit. Develop that fruit must grow. Strengthen that self-control. How do you, how do you, uh, uh, how do you uh, increase your self-control? By being self-controlled. By doing it. Make it up your mind. I'm going to do this. I'm going to pray. I'm going to be in work. I'm going to have devotion. I'm going to watch what I eat. I'm going to, you know, check my weight every day and make sure I'm okay or go to the doctor and get my checkups or whatever it is we're talking about. We use self-control in everything. We're temperate in everything. We stay away from the extremes. It's time to put a stop to this vicious cycle of failure and re-enter the race because God has called us, and he has a divine destiny and purpose for every one of us to be fulfilled upon this earth. He tells us that he's given every single one of us works that have been prepared just for us before we ever existed. He already had these works in place for every one of us to fulfill so that all working together, we have everything we need to do what God wants to do through us. It's time to break free from that stinking thinking and rise up out of that horrible pit, out of the mud, the muck the enemy has cast upon us, and let God put truth in your heart and put a new song in your mouth. Amen. In Psalms 40, verses 1 through 3, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me. we got to learn to wait on God. He is not a fast food God. He's not in that business. He wants us to wait upon him. Why? Because it's about relationship. He wants us to know him the same way he knows us. Wait upon the Lord. Be patient. He will incline to you. He hears our cries. He brings us up out of the horrible pit, out of the mire of the clay, and he sets our feet upon a rock and establishes our step. He puts a new song in our mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and trust in the Lord. That's where we want to be. Wait upon God. Don't give in to the devil. If you, don't, if you don't know what to do, 
wait upon God. If there's no peace in your heart, wait upon God. Don't just go run and do something. You need the peace of God controlling your heart. If there's no peace, wait. God will show you the way. God will show you the time. And God will make it perfect. Amen. The enemy works in darkness. Overcomers live and walk in the light. We live with transparency. We live with openness. We live being accountable to one another. As he says in Hebrews uh, 10, 25, not forsaking or neglecting to assemble together as believers, as is the habit of some people, but admonishing, warning, urging, and encouraging one another, and all the more faithfully as you see the day approaching. You've got to assemble together. Listen, unless we have a really good reason, we should be at every service. Because this is our family. This is where we get fed. This is where we grow up. This is where we are transformed. This is where God can minister to us and have the help that we need to do it. Amen. And so we need to be in meetings. We need to be in, in Sunday school. We need to be in prayer meetings. We need to be whenever we have church service or special meetings because this is where it's going to happen. This is where we're going to find what we need. And when you're going through trouble, you don't go the other way. You press in and get in this place as quick as you can. Why? Because here's your help. There's people here to help you. There's people here to minister. There's people here to whatever you have to deal with. That's why we have a church. That's the church. It's like a hospital. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 4, 2, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame. We don't walk in craftiness nor handle the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Again, we don't give the devil place. There should be no secret things in our lives because that's where the devil works, the secret things. See, we may not go, but God knows. <laughs> you, can't, you can't keep a secret from God. Amen. If we get that revelation, you might as well just confess because God already knows it. He already knows it. Don't run. Come, come to God. We, we, we're not, we're not going to, you know, re, we, we need to renounce these things. If there's something, you renounce it. Tell the devil you're done with this. You're finished. It's over. You're walking out free by the blood of Jesus. You're, you're, you're getting free from that thing, and it's done. It's finished. It's over. Not going that way anymore. Amen. And what do we do? We want to manifest the truth. Amen. All will see and know that we are people of truth. We are people of character. We're people of faithfulness. We're people of love and all these things. That's why in Psalms 119, 11, David said, Your word I've hid in my heart that I may, might not sin against you. This is why, again, you've got to be in the word and get the word in you. Amen. If the word's in your heart, that's one weapon you have against the devil and his lies. When the word's in your heart, what comes out of your mouth comes out of the heart, comes out of the mouth, it is written. If it is written in your heart, it can come out of your mouth. Devil, it is written. Get out of here. It's got to be in your heart, not your head, in your heart. It's not knowing about God. It's knowing God, knowing him intimately, personally. In John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. When will you know the truth that sets you free? When you abide in the Word. Get the Word in you and you in the Word. And you've got the greatest weapon. You have the, you have the literal uh, sword of the Holy Spirit is the Word of God. The sword of the Holy Spirit is the Word of God. So Jesus says, if you abide in His Word, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And he's dealing with sin. So verse 34, he says, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits or practices sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. That's why you don't give in to sin. Because as you abide, as you practice, as, a, as the enemy gets, gets that deeper and deeper, and you are overcome by that sin, you're going to walk out of the house. You'll be like the prodigal son, going to leave the house. And then God's got to wait for you to come back. He's probably going to take a pig pen to do it. 
A son abides forever. Who are the sons? Those who are led by the Spirit of God. The sons and daughters of God abide forever. Why? Because they stay with Christ. Because they walk in the Spirit. They live in the Spirit. They live a life unto God. So he says, therefore, if the sons make you free, you should be free indeed. Perfectly, completely, forever. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. That's why I say, I don't care what you've done, where you've been, what the devil got you bound up in. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. There's nothing he cannot break. There is no chain he can't break. There's no cord he cannot sever. There's no sin he can't overcome with his blood. There is nothing that, that the devil can do that Jesus can't undo. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, and he amplified, he says, For the grace of God has come forward and appeared for deliverance from sin and eternal salvation for all mankind. God gives you grace to deliver you from sin. Your faith in him, who he is and what he can do in the blood of Christ, he gives you the grace to set you free completely, totally, and forever. Free indeed. Free indeed. You see, you're fighting a battle that Jesus already won. God didn't give you a spirit of fear. He's given you a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. We just got to bring them all into agreement with the Spirit of God. It is written, the destroy, the anointing destroys the yoke. In Isaiah 58, 6, Jesus came to loose the bands of wickedness to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. It is written, he has severed the cord of wickedness, broken my chains, raised me up, and brought me into the glorious liberty of the sons and daughters of God. Whatever chain it is, God is here to break it, to set you free. We are blood-bought children of God, and greater is he that is us than he that is this world. We are our beloveds, and he is ours. We have victory through Jesus Christ. He always leads us in triumph in Christ. We have the mind of Christ. No one can snatch us out of his hands for the thoughts that he thinks towards us. He gives us thoughts of peace, thoughts of good and not evil, and he gives us an expected end if we will follow him. He has a future and a reward for all of us. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, If you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on the things of this earth. Again, get your mind in the right place. Focus on him. Focus on you. Seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, far above every principality, power, dominion, and might. Sitting with Jesus above all these powers of darkness. Why? Because you died, your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, you will also appear with him in glory. Quit focusing on your problems. Quit focusing on the natural things. Focus on the eternal things. Focus on the, the spiritual things. Amen? Because that's where our deliverance is. That's where our, 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 uh, 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 where we'll be set free. In Psalms chapter 78, 41, he says, Again and again they tempted God, and they limited the Holy One of Israel. How many times do we limit the Holy One Israel? Because we don't know what he can do. He says they did not remember his power when he redeemed them from the enemy. Remember where you came from. Remember where Jesus brought you from and what he did to set you free. Don't forget that. Why? Because then you're going to know that there's no limit to the Holy One of Israel. There's no limit to God's power. There's no limit with what God can do in us and for us. Amen. There's nothing he cannot do for us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, the weapons of warfare are not carnal. We have weapons that are mighty in God to pull down every single stronghold of the enemy. We cast down every argument, every high thing that exalts the sense of God against the knowledge of God, and we bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Every time that temptation comes, you cast that thing down. It's a lie. It's a deception. You cast it down. Amen. Every high thing, everything that is contrary to the word and nature and character of God, you cast it down immediately. Do not let it take root. Do not let it get down out of your mind. Cast that thing down from the get-go. Amen. And every thought you bring into captivity to Jesus Christ. You agree what God says. Amen. And when you do that, the enemy's got nothing left to do. Except leave, we reject the lies of the enemy. We hold fast to the truth. 
Amen. We take captive every thought that is not of God and bring in obedience to Christ. Amen. In Romans chapter 6, verse 17, But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obey from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you become slaves of righteousness. Whom you yield yourself to obey, you become their slaves. Learn to yield to God. Yield to what is right, what is righteous, what is pure, what is undefiled. The more you yield to righteousness, the more you become the slave of righteousness, and the less you are apt to be tempted or to fall or to stumble along the way. But if you yield to sin, sooner or later, you're going to become the slave of sin. And that's not where we want to go. We have become slaves of God. Amen. We want to walk in liberty. We want to walk in that place of freedom. Amen. So, again, it's got a lot to do with our minds being renewed according to the Word of God and a lot to do with the condition of our heart. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is it. We need to think the thoughts of God in our hearts, concerning our hearts, concerning who we are in Christ. Amen? And, 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 and enforcing that and, and increasing that as we abide in the Word of God and learn the truths of God and have the power of His Word to use against any evil attack that comes against us. Amen? Praise God. If you're here tonight and you've been dealing with any kind of areas that uh, you just can't seem to get victory over. And again, we're not talking about making a mistake, but there's just an area that you just, you, 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 you fall into it, you, you get back up, you think you're going, and then back again and back again, and it's like there's a stronghold on you. You just can't seem to break the chain. Amen. We've all had them sometime or other, I guarantee you. But Jesus wants to set you free. And he's given us the truth to do that. You can end that cycle right here tonight. You can put an end to the work of the devil in your life right now because the blood is able to do what you cannot. He can sever that chain. He can break that cord from your life and set you free. And all we got to do is give it to him. Tell God we got a problem. We need some help. And God, we're sick and tired of it. We're, we're sick and tired of going back and forth. We're sick and tired of, of, of the devil, you know, working on us and, 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 and overcoming us. I'm ready to be free now. I'm ready to be free indeed. I'm ready for you to break this thing off of me and set me completely free and not go back again because it's indeed forever and ever. He wants to do that for you tonight. doesn't matter what it is, anything you've ever done. There's nothing too hard. There's nobody that's sinned <laughs> that's beyond the scope of, God, of, of Christ's blood. So I want to take a little bit of time tonight. If, if you're here and you're dealing with something, you don't have to tell us what it is. But I want you to come up here, and I want you to agree, with, agree together with us. Let's, let's let God put an end to that cycle in your life and get your feet on solid ground and get, put a new song in your heart, get you out of the muck and the mire and get you on that rock-solid ground where you can be free. And you can sing the praises of God because you've been liberated from that wicked thing. Amen. So if you're here tonight, I want you to just come up. And we're going to pray over you and believe God to wield the sword of his spirit and set you free, whatever it is, and uh, break those chains so you can walk out of this place rejoicing in your heart that the blood has set you free. Amen. Amen. Amen.